Good morning. I'm Barbara Colson and I'm going to be I am going to be moderating the first panel, which is the General Counsel View, Challenges and Opportunities. By way of introduction, I am um, the former general counsel of three startups, startup aspirational luxury companies, um, Stuart Weitzman, Seven for All Mankind, and Kate Spade. Um, it's been about 25 years um, in that world. I was also assistant general counsel of Calvin Klein Jeans and um, West Point Stevens, a um, textile company, and probably been through more transactions than anybody in this room. Um, <laughs> my panelists include Lorenzo Maria DiVecchio, who is the Global Compliance Manager and member of the Supervisory Board of Fendi, the Italian Maison, part of the LVMH group, headquartered in Rome in Italy. He joined Fendi in June 2014 after having legal counsel roles at Colgate Palmolive, Hills Pet Nutrition, and Heineken. That's an interesting background. Um, Giorgia Armani, um, yeah. not related to Giorgio as I learned. Um, Unfortunately not. <laughs> It's a great name, and that we'll have to have a conversation about how, how it came to be. Georgia is currently general counsel at Furla, the Italian company created by the Furla Neto family in 1927, which is a key player in the global leather goods and accessories market and loyal to traditional Italian methods of art and design. I am Italian, by the way. She acts as a trusted advisor to the president and the CEO of the company and provides a corporate secretary function to all group companies. Um, Christina Gian, um, who is, um, who after seven years in the corporate finance industry joined Charlotte Olympia in 2014 to take on the new role of general counsel. On any given day, Christina's role covers and oversees an array of areas including corporate governance, company secretarial responsibilities, structuring, franchising, distribution, real estate, employment, and IP protection. This sounds like my life, and you're so much younger. Christina is also responsible for HR, um, human resources, globally, and takes on an operational role. And finally, Michael Ellis, um, who I met last year at this wonderful meeting, who's GC of, he, he has my dream job, actually. He is GC, company secretary, and chief compliance officer of the International international luxury travel company Abercrombie and Kent, which I took a gorilla trip with last year to die from. Do it before you die. Um, Mr. Ellis is responsible for the legal risk, compliance, and regulatory matters for the global business, which encompasses 50 offices across all continents. So are we all wired up and ready to go? Okay. Barbara, gonna... sorry. If you see that I don't move anymore because I'm I'm completely freezed. Okay. <laughs> Can you please ask to load down the air conditioning because... Oh, the air conditioning. Yeah. Okay. Can we lower it's, the air conditioning? Uh, I don't know if you are okay, but for me it's too cold, okay. definitely. No, and the air, the cold air just uh, on my oh, back. Oh, no. Uh, please. Do you mind? Uh, <laughs> sorry, but uh, I'm Italian and I need... Oh, no, it's okay. It's okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Let us start with, why don't we start from this end? Michael, why don't we start with um, the question. What, tell, tell us just generally what your company does and what you do. And one third question, are you the first, for each of you, the first general counsel of your company? Uh, yes. I, I'm, I'm Abercrombie and Kent didn't have a, a general counsel until I came along uh, three years ago. Um, they mostly used um, outside counsel and the CFO used to just um, point out um, outside counsel and just go that route. Um, we, um, we're a luxury travel company, um, so we make your dreams come true. Um, and as we did for, uh, for Barbara, um, we are all, all around the world, um, in South America, in Africa, in Asia, um, and it's one of our strengths is, you know, with the geopolitical events that we have around the world at the moment, being able to uh, send you to places which are safe. Um, so we don't send anyone to Syria at the moment. Um, we used to. I mean, it was a, it was a great uh, tourist place. Um, so do you want me to just 
Is that enough? And then we'll pass it around and sure. come back for more. The answer is yes. I've been the first general counsel. Uh, actually, I created the legal department. When I joined the company, I just start from the very beginning. The, the, I created the archive because uh, I realized that the, in a retail company, there were no idea of the expiry dates of the lease agreements. So um, I just started from uh, the very beginning of the organization of the structure, basically. Um, now uh, I have to say that Fula, it's uh, my grandmother, because uh, next year, as you said, it has been founded in 1927. Next year will mark 90 years in the business. And I have to say that in the last four years, uh, we grew up a lot. And also the legal department grew up. Uh, now there are just three of us, me and the other two girls, taking care of the legal staff for the entire world. And it has been challenging, uh, but uh, it, we succeed. Okay. Yeah. So as you mentioned, I am the first general counsel. We didn't have a role. I think similar to Michael, we relied a lot upon outside counsel and previous CFOs have sort of taken on a little bit of a legal role and a hat. Um, our business is much younger than yours. We've only been around since 2008. Um, our CEO and creative designer is Charlotte Olympia Delau, and hence Charlotte Olympia. And her sort of go-to era is old Hollywood. So a lot of our designs, a lot of our inspirations for shoes and accessories and handbags really come from that. And I think that legacy carries across everything that we do, which is also, you know, the idea of structure and, and building something of substance is really, hence why I came in at, I guess, a much earlier stage than people would expect a general counsel to come in. Mm -hmm. Um, well, contrary to my colleagues, I have to say that Fendi, when I joined the company, has already a structure, well structured legal department with more than 10 people. Uh, so when I joined it, I was asked to, um, to structure something different. So um, the compliance function, which is part of the legal department for some uh, area. On the other hand, it reports directly to the board of directors because, as I said, I'm also a member of the supervisor board, which uh, reports directly to, to the board of directors. Fendi, uh, I am managing compliance uh, at worldwide level. I have a report but I, at headquarters, but I've also, uh, since Fendi is part of LVMH group, we, we are lucky that we can uh, work together with um, lawyers from the group all over the world. So I, I'm li liaised with them on a daily basis at worldwide level. It's interesting. When I, one of my favorite compliments was from John Howard from Irving Place Capital, who called me the designated adult when I was hired by Seven for All Mankind um, to start the legal department. And I think, it, I think this, it's an interesting challenge. All four of you and I um, have wor worked for companies that are founder, kind of founder founded. Um, I think you have, in a way, the best scenario because in, I, my last company, Stuart Weitzman, had four owners in seven years nearly killed me, um, two, pro two public companies, two private equity. And I think, the, I think being part of a public company is a great gift because all that structure, all that is in place already. And when you have to say no, or when you have to say, we have to do it this way, you've got you know, another parent above you. Um, what is the biggest challenge, um, particularly for you three in working for a family, or owner-founded um, fashion company? Um, actually, uh, yes, it's correct. Fula is a family-owned company right now, but um, no secret, it's already on the press. We have set in motion plan to go public, and uh, probably it will happen at the end of 2007. Um, I have to say that uh, I experienced the uh, transformation because as I joined the company, uh, Fula was already um, family focused. 
But then the president decided to uh, implement a strong managerial structure, and now uh, there have been the entry of gifted professionals that are leading the company right now. And so the family made a step behind, and uh, the uh, guidance of the company is led by the managing director and the general manager. So uh, I have to say that to see uh, the transition, it's very interesting, and uh, it, it helped me a lot to grow professionally because uh, everything has to be done right from the start. And right now, we are uh, try as legal team and uh, the management are trying to educate all the employees uh, to put in place process and uh, to create an organized structure. Right now, um, we are just uh, trying to implement the 231 model, which is uh, something that it's mandatory for Italian company to go public, and you cannot imagine the resistance. But uh, it's something that needs to be done, and you have to explain that it's uh, not necessary evil, but it's something good for mm -hmm. the organization. Absolutely. Christina? I think if I had joined probably two or three years before 2014, it might have been something slightly different. I mean, we are a creatively led business. Charlotte is our creative director. And at the end of the day, her products are what sell. So that's extremely important to our business. But having said that, by the time I had joined, we'd moved, I guess, beyond that startup stage. Mm -hmm. And we were sort of in the process of professionalizing. We have people who are extremely qualified at the, in their roles and actually have come with, with the breadth of experience. And, and I guess that is what they were trying to draw on in, in placing a general counsel. So the idea of having, I suppose, opposition or some sort of barrier to creating a structure, like Georgia was saying, or creating a uh, boundaries or you know, making sure people understand what, what the role of a legal counsel is, let alone how you can then input to them. It actually wasn't one for me, and I think I was quite fortunate. Um, the challenge that I think I faced is that I had come from an in-house and a private practice background from quite well-established organizations that had been there for a very long time. And, had clear rules about how to do things and what to do and why to do them. And then breeding that across to a much younger organization is always, um, you have to understand exactly why you're doing it, but you also have to be able to adapt it to a younger organization, a creatively led organization, but most importantly, an, in, an organization that's in the fashion industry mm -hmm. and in the luxury industry as well. Absolutely. Michael? Um, our founder, J Jeffrey Kent, is. 73 years old, and he's married to a 28-year-old Brazilian swimwear model. <laughs> he, he has an enormous amount of energy. <laughs> he, now that's, he, he still thinks he's running the company out the back of his Land Rover in Kenya. Um, so that creates its challenges for a legal department. Um, oh, and, been there, yeah. done that. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he has fan lots of fantastic ideas about uh, what we should be doing and how to develop the company. Um, and out of all of those I ideas, you know, he'll come up with them uh, regularly, is, is trying to choose those ones um, which we think are going to work. Um, compliance is, a, uh, is quite an issue as well for us. Um, I mean, we're, we're in uh, some of the more challenging countries in the world. Um, uh, Myanmar, for example, we have quite an operation there. That's a cash economy, um, so that's quite tricky. And um, Kenya uh, is quite tricky as well, Tanzania, um, anywhere in, uh, in East Africa. Um, so, 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 so the compliance side, but you know, when you have uh, you know, people who are 73 who, um, you'll see, if any of you have read his memoirs, which, which are out at the moment, um, you know, he, he writes a story there about having to um, actually pay to get his clients out of a, out of a country. Um, he had to actually hand over cash um, because the army surrounded one of his camps and wouldn't let his clients out. Um, so someone who's operated in those sort of areas where he's had to do that, uh, and um, I have to tell him he can't do that anymore. Um, mm -hmm. That would put him in prison. Um, so those are um, some of the more you know, it's, uh, not so interesting challenges I face. <laughs> I, think, I think actually one of the many of you in this audience represent 
um, I either work for or represent fashion clients, and there is a definite sense of, of rules are a little bit different because we're creative, because we're creative people, because we're luxury designers, because we've done so well, and you know catapulted to the top in such a short time, the rules are a little different. And I think truly one of the biggest challenges for me was having to, having to be the, the adult to say no. Um, does, LVM, it, does being part of LVMH change that? And you have this amazing compliance role. Oh, I love that word. Um, does, d does that make your job easier? Well, uh, yeah, Sandy. <laughs> no, first of all, I'd like to remind you that LVMH is a family group because oh, it's owned by Mr. Bernardo No. So at the second step, there is Absolutely. always a family behind. So the big family. <laughs> the big family. And then we have not to forget that Fendi joined the LVMH group beginning of 2000. Yeah. So it, it uh, spent 80 years as a family-owned company. So yes, uh, it has changed, but still, we have to, to, to try to, to bring this, this, new, this new approach. I'm coming from different uh, background, different industries, such as American companies as Colgate, Palmolive, Hills Pet Nutrition, Heineken, and the Dutch company, where they were a bit more structured. And first of all, in my opinion, because uh, uh, both of that companies were uh, highly regulated compared to the luxury industry where at the end of the day, we don't have very strict rules, but the, the, the general ones. If you work for a food and beverage company, you are very well regulated with uh, specific laws, as well as if you work for a cosmetic detergent or medical company. Luxury doesn't have a very strict rules. So uh, coming back to what we were saying before, even for a legal or a compliance officer, it's not that easy to, to pass the, the, the message that we cannot do this because uh, there's, there's no specific rules, you know, so. Yeah. Now, we, uh, we, we talked about the size of your departments, and I just want to reiterate, are you just a one-man band? I, I have quite a large legal department. You it, do? It's me and my very large ego. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I was the sole. I was the only. I was, my ego was was it for the last fifteen years. So, and you one. Just three. Three. Three, including me. And one. one. I love it. And two in compliance. Well, but more than ten in. Right. Legal. But still, think about this. I always like to point this out, um, particularly to you outside counsel. And we'll talk later. I'll be on a panel about about M and A and due diligence and. You know, it's it's hard work. Um, we are s relatively small departments. You think about the, you know, the these brands and how enormous they are, even yours, and how small these departments are. Um, and we have, you know, when the company is going through an IPO or being going through a, a, any sort of merger acquisition, um, we we're doing the work. We're doing the due diligence. Um, as well as our regular job. And in creating these departments, um, we're not just dealing with IP. That's another kind of f falsity. I think people think that we in-house GCs are just IP lawyers, um, and we're not. <laughs> Definitely not. I mean, one of the biggest challenges I faced, and I'll be interested in, in, in your thoughts on this, um, is um, employment law. Um, and the whole HR function. When I started each of my three startup first GC jobs, we had no HR function. And HR is a, probably the most vulnerable part of the business because frankly, employees act like people and are very complicated and do very complicated <laughs> things. Um, and there's a lot of sexual harassment, there's a lot of, there, there are issues cross-culturally in terms of employment at will versus, you know, in France where you can never get fired. That's where I'm coming back in my next life. Um, <laughs> so let's talk briefly about the various function, the various areas that you have to deal with within your company, the various business units that you have to deal with and who you spend the most time with. Michael? Um, 
Yeah, employment, yeah, I mean, employment is an important one, especially when it comes to compliance, because if we have a look at the, the things which sort of keep us awake at night, I mean, um, anti-bribery and corruption, um, making sure that all the staff are trained properly, and that's globally, um, so getting out online training to absolutely everyone, that's very, very important, and making sure that they actually do it. Um, and getting buy-in from the managing directors in every single office, that's very important. The other one um, is data protection. Um, you know, we all think that we are susceptible to hacking from externally, and we're all very worried about that, and that's quite public, that someone's gonna hack in and steal our secrets or steal our database or our, our, our client information and, then, and, and, and make that public. Um, but in actual fact, it's, you know, the threat is more from inside than it is from externally. I mean, you've, you, you know, you've got people leaving c computers unprotected, uh, people using thumb drives, um, things like that, which are, you know, it, it's the human element which is uh, where you're going to have probably the most, most problems. So dealing with um, the IT department on, on that sort of side of things um, is very important. On, on the business, working with the business, um, I get phone calls from all around the world with certain things. Um, I'll get stuff. I, I had a call from Morocco recently saying, we're gonna, we've got a, a bunch of, um, well, a, well, a group of Chinese billionaires who want to take Jeeps down from Morocco through Mauritania into Senegal. Any problems? I said, I said well, how, how are you going to get through Mauritania? That's, and they said, oh, we, we've got a military escort to take them through. And they said, are there any legal issues? I said, well, uh, military escort makes me slightly worried why anyone would want to go on holiday where they need a military escort. Um, but they went and they, they enjoyed it. But, but, but so I'm dealing with each office which comes to me with those sort of issues. We had another one where a lady of 73 wanted to climb Kilimanjaro. And I said, well, how, how are you going to get, how is she going to get up there? And they said, well, carry her. Have we got any legal implications with carrying someone to the top of Kilimanjaro? I, my Uganda trip, yeah. two people were carried. Yeah. So we're quite happy to carry you anywhere you want to go. Um, when we got to the top of, got her to the top of Kilimanjaro, she asked for a, for a bag and we handed over a bag to her and she took out a pair of monoblonic shoes and put them on and said, right, take my photograph. <laughs> and it was on her bucket list to have a photograph taken on the top of Kilimanjaro in her favorite monoblonic shoes. And did you get a cease and desist letter from Manolo? <laughs> We just carried it back down again. I was a bit worried about the, the poor porters. But, you know, so, we do, you know, the, the questions that you get asked in a legal department um, can be, you know, from the sublime to the ridiculous. Uh, but you have to be prepared to be able to answer them all um, and, 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 to just, uh, and just to get on with it. I think with a get-on department. Likely enough, I'm not in charge of employment law because the HR department takes care of that. Uh, it's good for the company because I would never fire someone. So, <laughs> um, besides that, I have to say that I uh, take care of all the other department. Uh, creative people, especially, drive me mad. And I try to teach them um, uh, if they can inspire and uh, to which extent, extent they have to inspire themselves to something else. Uh, commercial, uh, commercial department, the IT department is uh, requesting us a lot of work. Um, and I have to say that uh, all the uh, subsidiaries around the world are asking us uh, any kind of uh, legal assistance. So it's, um, uh, it, with the only exception of the labor uh, stuff, we take care of everything. So I have only recently acquired the HR piece, um, technically speaking, but I think it probably goes very much hand in hand with what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, um, as does the ops piece and the operational side of things. And I think the reason I think that is because, and this is the way I've always tended to operate, it is about the people and the legal kind of sits behind the scenes. So if you can't get on with the legal, you've got an issue with the people. Um, so for me, it was really, especially coming in as the first person and nobody necessarily knows what role you do have, it's getting to understand who the people are and then subsequently what their roles and their functions are. And then also in my case, really understanding that 
creative sometimes trumps legal. Um, and part of that is then, well, if it's going to trump, then you need to learn to speak creative language. And nobody wants to learn to speak legal if you're not the lawyer. Um, and being the only lawyer in the organization, nobody else wants to speak my language. So mm -hmm. in that case, you really have to figure out Instead of talking, oh, well, this is the design, and this is how you get it registered, and this is what, what might look like it's infringing, it's coming right back to it and saying, well, who owns it? Do you know? Are you creating something that is your own and speaking their language? And I think they then learn to respect you. They then learn to build that trust with you. And that's the human element. And the flip side of that is obviously there's, there's the employment piece, and, and I think that often... Um, you know, you can often become the scapegoat because it's easy. Yes. Um, and, and I think, you know, you sort of learn to wear that and I think you have to expect that in your role, uh, regardless of whether it's right or wrong. And there's emotion involved. And like you were saying, people are human, your employees are human. And if something good is happening, then they, they, they're all excited. If something is bad has happened, you're still the one to deliver the news. And that might be regardless of, you know, how you might want to... Um, emotionally deliver the message, there's still a legal message to be delivered. But I think that first piece, being able to get to know them as a person, really then helps that second piece. Absolutely. I mean, I think the bottom line is we are service providers. I say this over and over to my young mentees, that we are in the service end of the building, I, of the business. I always say, think of yourself more like a flight attendant. Um, you know, you're going to bring the food, you're going to make sure they don't choke and die of it, and you're going to clear the plate, and hopefully everything will go well. Yeah, well, I, I work with the HR department, not for firing people, but to, to, to be sure that uh, they manage people in compliance with the law. For instance, the Italian government has recently issued a new law which should uh, ease firing people. So, but on the other hand, it's not that straight, so we have to, to help and assist our department in order to avoid you know having uh, hundreds of uh, people uh, out of uh, the company uh, overnight i am, i am as a compliance officer i also work for um, uh, product compliance which is a, an important part of our daily job we have to comply with uh, uh, very strict laws across the world I'm citing, for instance, uh, uh, REACH, which is the European regulation for uh, chemicals, as well as in the US, uh, Prop 65. Prop, my favorite, Prop 65. Yeah. I, I've heard, I've heard, you know, uh, as many of you know, uh, there are sort of professional uh, clay contestant mm -hmm. that they, they, they try to find the, the bug in the, in the, in the label. Th that happens also in China with uh, uh, GB uh, regulation, which is even stricter than the US one. I've heard from my colleagues in the US that now US uh, uh, insurance companies are providing companies with Prop 65 insurance, which also covers the legal expenses. So that has that, been that, let's give the magnitude. Prop of, of 65 the has been a boon for class action lawyers in California and yeah. insurance companies. Yeah. And uh, even in, in China, we have to, to struggle every day with the authorities because they are very, very strict in... Uh, yes. Yeah. Prop 65, by the way, for those of you who don't know, is California's hazardous substance law, which was, uh, uh, um, if you're California voters, you know there are propositions that when you're voting in the election, there's always a proposition at the end, and it has a very cool name, like this one was, you know, the Safe Waters Act or something, but it really created this enormous... Um, um, issue for fashion law, I mean, fashion companies include, particularly any jewelry, co jewelry companies, um, anything that pops, like a patent leather shoe, um, will have a, a Proposition 65, Prop 65 component. Um, one of my, um, when I worked for Stuart Weitzman, he was so horrified that um, we had to sign on to a Prop 65 settlement because we were part of a public company, and he was so angry he wanted to stop selling in California because uh, it just applies to California. And I said, so we're going to close the store in Beverly Hills? I mean, those are the kinds of conversations you have with creative founders because they, how could they do this to me? But we have to do it. So what's your biggest challenge in the digital um, 
part of the market. I mean, I come from the world pre-digital, and I think our one first presentation um, was quite marvelous in terms of describing the fact that so many of our luxury brands really have to start coordinating both um, brick and mortar and, and di the digital world. Um, I know certainly towards the end of my um, long career, digital was a tremendous challenge because I didn't know what any of this stuff did. I mean, when my creative people would come in and we had six, you know, 17 contracts for one little online film, um, you know, what's, you know, what is this thing and what does it do? And what, so that we, we made sure to sign a contract that had indemn proper indemnities. And I think sometimes your basic legal expertise in terms of contracts and torts um, is what serves you best in the long run. But what's your biggest digital um, challenge? Michael? Um, well, f for us, the, um, w we've had to redevelop what um, our interface with, with the, the, uh, the consumer. Um, you all know that when you want to book a holiday, you, you tend to go online and you have a look around and you, have to, you, you see what's online. Everything's very transparent as well um, with prices and things like that. Um, and people are expecting a little bit more. They're expecting to see it on their phones. They're expecting to see it on their tablets. And they're expecting to be able to book things. And it, um, it's been a bit of a challenge for us because um, we have a lot of bespoke travel. So, so you will come and you will say, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to do you know, this sort of trip. Um, and that's very difficult um, to be able to book something like that online. Um, so we've had to spend a lot of time developing um, the software behind that sort of thing. Because if you think about the logistics behind it is, if you want to go do, say, a multi-country trip in Africa, you want to go on safari, you want to do Kenya, Tanzania, and maybe do Uganda and Zambia. You know, you've got a lot of little airplanes you've got to get on, you've got a lot of little lodges you've got to stay in, um, and you've got transport as well. So if, if you're planning your trip and then, you, you, you know, you want to be able to do that online, that's quite tricky to do because you have to be able to pull in all the availability from all these different places. And little airplanes, you know, they're not big airlines. Um, you know, so getting that information together is, is, is quite a challenge for us. Um, and it's, 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 it's a program that we've been working on for quite a while now um, to get to that. I mean, if you're doing a, what we call a fly and flop holiday, that's, that's quite easy. You go and book a flight and you book a hotel and off you go. It, it, it's, it's quite a simple thing to do. I wouldn't recommend you do that because if you do that, then you don't fall under the, the travel regulations and you don't get all the protection. So it's always better to you know, buy a package from, uh, from, a, from a travel agent, like us, of course. Um, um, <clears throat> the other thing is obviously getting across um, using video a lot more now. Um, so the digital side, so you being able to go on the site and actually being able to see um, a clip of um, a safari or a, a little bit of, say, our, private, our around the world private jet, being able to see quite a bit of that on video. People want to see that sort of thing. Uh, Instagram is huge as well, very, very important. Uh, I mean, Jeff Kent is on our Around the World uh, jet trip at the moment, but lots of postings of that is very, very important. So you've got to be up with social media all the time. Um, also, you've got to decide on whether you're going to use brand ambassadors as well um, and their social media and their Instagram accounts as well. So that's all very new for us. And of course, all of these come with contracts. Um, lots of contracts, lots of different ideas behind it, um, making sure that you, you can actually you know, tie people in for the length of time you want to and that they can't just you know, go and immediately um, exclusivity you need. Uh, we have to have a look at that quite closely as well. Um, but I uh, recognize I'm talking a lot now, so here you go. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is a challenge related to compliance just to mention your, your field of expertise. Uh, because uh, it required us a lot of work to implement privacy compliance uh, on the digital world around the world. Um, and uh, this is something that it's still ongoing mm -hmm. because uh, you have to uh, customize 
uh, the privacy information, the privacy notice for each single pro uh, project, because um, there are several projects ongoing, uh, the contest, uh, the uh, e-commerce website, the uh, social network, and so on and so forth. In California, and of course. In California, yes. In the United States, it's, a, it's a quite a nightmare. But also in Russia or in China, it's very complicated uh, to understand how to manage the database, what kind of data, consumer data you can collect, and uh, if you can transfer that abroad or not. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are working a lot with the local consultant to understand exactly what are the requirements imposed by local law on privacy and uh, how can we deal with that. Uh, beside that, uh, we are trying to impose to all our distributors online certain uh, requirements just to um, be sure that the brand is taken care of enough mm. because uh, we don't want uh, our brand put besides other brands that we don't want to be confused of. Um, so there are a lot of contracts that needs to be drafted just to impose certain requirements to all, uh, all the distributor. Um, and then of course uh, the uh, counterfeiting uh, that uh, we uh, actually we cooperate with them with some of the sponsor here to, to try to fight all the fake goods that are always around on the e-commerce platform. So I think taking the, uh, the business side first, we are a business first and foremost led by Charlotte, and Charlotte runs our Instagram, Charlotte runs our Twitter feed, and all of it is personalized by her. Mm -hmm. And in that same way, everything that we do, whether, you know, whether it be on Ecom or otherwise, is always Charlotte and Charlotte Olympia very much branded as a personality. Mm -hmm. um, so I think one of the challenges that we have is making sure in everything technology based it carries her personality and it carries the personalized touch to it so you know there's consistently a lot of tweaking on on the business side in that respect but i think the flip side of that is that you often then get quite iconic shoes and iconic products which you know you get cat ears and you get kitty bags and the like and suddenly you see that social media has run with it and social media has taken it and used it on WhatsApp and posted it and said, well, if you'd like to buy your counterfeits, exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Or if you, here is something that, I mean, I've actually seen on QVC, here is an iconic brand that looks like this and here is the one that we're selling, but we're calling it something else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the fact that there is so much technology out there mm -hmm. means that there are so many more forms for people to buy from. And yes, our products are expensive and they sort of, are very much tailored to a specific market, hence the luxury, but it makes our products accessible to a whole different market mm -hmm. and it, it effectively dilutes your brand. Mm -hmm. And that's the idea. If you're, you're really trying to make Charlotte the iconic figure of it all, then having counterfeits, copycats, whatever you want to call them out there and across distribution channels on the, on the internet, across you know, multiple devices, really it waters down your brand and it takes away. So it's really trying to build in structure um, and, and footholds for your business, whether it be you know, your wholesalers can't sell to people like Secret Sale or to sort of those, I guess, gray market areas to dilute your brand in that way because you're consistently selling to the top line of, of department stores and wholesalers, and then also making sure that at the counterfeit end, you're addressing it properly and in a fulsome fashion. So it's, it's, I think they go hand in hand. Right. I think it's further complicated by trying to explain to your founder, designer, that everything is not protectable. That is a very tough conversation to have because it, it's, of course it's, I mean, that we could do a whole session on, on you know, the differences in the laws in the US and in Europe, and particularly in the US, there's very little protection um, apart from trademark, a little bit of copyright and design patent. So often you have to say to your designer, this is horrible, but there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah, I have to say that it's, yeah, it's ev evident that technology is uh, easing uh, the business. Uh, as uh, was pointing out before Mr. Solka, uh, and uh, I totally agree with uh, what he was saying, uh, now the approach is knowing customers by name, which is absolutely true. 
um, the business is uh, closer and closer to to customers. They they are trying to 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 make them living an experience which is absolutely fantastic. On the other hand, uh, that implies lots of uh, rules to be uh, respected, uh, uh, as correctly highlighted. We are speaking about privacy law for company for luxury companies such ours. Customer relationship management is uh, vital and crucial, but that uh, leads to to different uh, laws to be to be uh, complied with uh, across the world, um, as well as uh, e-commerce. Uh, we were speaking uh, before about e-commerce. Um, we, we know, for instance, that uh, recently the Court of Appeal of Frankfurt. Uh, asked for a uh, preliminary ruling to the Court of Justice in order to, to say if banning uh, online uh, sales via third parties, banning distributors to, to sale via third parties online uh, is uh, in compliance or not with competition law. Mm -hmm. So even if, if we put in place selective distribution policies, uh, we are not 100% sure that it will be enough to to allow authorities to say that we are in compliance so we are expecting end of this year this uh, end of this year this ruling that will uh, of course clarify even this point so business wise we are running and we are uh, closer and closer to our customers uh, from a legal standpoint that means that uh, it is uh, even uh, more difficult to to try to assist them in the proper way it's made our jobs very complicated because let's face it, luxury is all about selective distribution. We can sell to who we want. We don't have to sell to Walmart. We, and this is a, a global issue and I think it's getting very complicated by, by the, these sorts of things. Let me ask you, most of you came in, uh, coming in as the first um, GC, first lawyer in a company, you took over work from outside counsel. Um, so for, for the sake of our out, many outside lawyers in the firm, what, what, was, what was that like and how do you use outside counsel currently? Why don't we start with you? Uh, I have to say that uh, but even in my, in my previous experiences, I've always uh, worked more in-house than uh, giving uh, to outside counsels. Uh, because at the end of the day, we have also to, to justify our job, mm -hmm. uh, especially to our uh, CEO. Uh, so on one hand, we, we tend to, to internalize our daily, daily job. Uh, we, we deal with, of course, with external counsel, but uh, we have to admit and we have to say that uh, at the end of the day, the very last decision belongs to the in-house counsel. Right. So we, we, we could have the, even the, the, the best uh, legal opinion ever, but then there's also uh, 100 pages of uh, uh, based on what you said to us, based on the documentation that we had the chance to, to look at uh, uh, if the weather is raining or not. Uh, then uh, it's up to you because uh, the law is always gray, so up to you the final decision. <laughs> so I, 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 I saw tons of uh, legal opinions such as this, and as said, uh, legal external counsels are uh, crucial, and especially, I would say, external counsel that are used to dealing with companies because uh, we as in-house counsel uh, need to have uh, a decision, to have uh, uh, a, a proper opinion and we in turn have to say to our uh, internal client yes or no. We cannot say grey. Right. I mean external counsel is, is crucial. I'm a one man band. There is absolutely no way I could do all of their jobs and mine. Um, when I came on board, the given that we're such a young company, the IP portfolio had started but had just sort of kick started. Um, I'd say we're probably in the first two years when I first joined. That is not a piece that I had expertise in. I came in as a, as a corporate M&A lawyer. Um, it's, th there are people who are much more qualified than I am. There are people who do this on a daily basis, and you know, I think probably some of them are sitting out there. Um, but 
it's important that I give that piece to them because it means that I can run the strategic piece. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably what's more important. Yes, they, they receive instruction, but they know how to get on with their jobs on a daily basis. What I can then run with is effectively how to keep guiding them, but how do I take the streamlining and the efficiency into the business, make sure I'm utilizing their, their opportunities where I can, um, but also effectively putting a clean structure into place. And mm -hmm. you know, when it, it's not a limited, limitless fund, um, making sure that, that what we do with external counsel is probably efficient, it's to the point, and you're really not wasting funds, but at the same time, on the flip side of that, you're creating a business structure that sits behind the scenes that also allows you to do that. And more importantly, your board, your, your, um, your CEOs and the like, they see the upside of having external counsel as well. And I think they have a unique set of skills that as the in-house person, whilst you're in the weeds and in the daily business of the strategy, they have the ability to see what's also going on in the bigger scheme of things, particularly on the counterfeiting and an IP side of things. Have any, any of you, by the way, ever had the issue um, dealing with very trusted outside counsel who your management goes directly to even when you're, even after you've moved in-house? For me, that's yes and no. I think there was initially, there's always going to be that, 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 that beginning transition. I think we work in a very transparent, uh, flat structure. Mm -hmm. So there is, they may go straight to, but it's always you know someone else or you are CC'd. I don't think there's ever, ever the, I'm just jumping over my in-house legal counsel. And I think that, at least for our structure, would be quite, it'd just create bad blood and it'd yeah. create additional obstacles. And actually, you just want it to be as simple as possible. Yeah. Just to answer your question, yes, when I joined the company, there was a law firm, uh, the president trusted the most, but they do not work with us anymore. <laughs> no, Been because, uh, um, you know, actually I just started to uh, question uh, the amount of fees and the quality of work, and I couldn't stand the fact that he continued to talk directly to the president, avoiding me. Um, mm. So, uh, anyway, in a few months, stop working with us. Uh, right now, I just uh, identify some law firm that I trust the most and to try to negotiate retainer agreement just to keep legal costs under control. As you said, it's impossible to work without external consultant for uh, several reasons, because uh, they are um, they have field of expertise, so they know uh, all the uh, new updatings uh, uh, on uh, on the law, and they, they have experience because they deal with a similar matter before. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to uh, mention uh, the problem, uh, Lorenzo uh, talk about the fact that they do not bring solution. Uh, this is something that I always try to teach to uh, external consultant. If I bring you a problem, I want a solution, no, no, not another problem. Mm -hmm. What I um, need to uh, present to the management are problem in plain words, not legalese, mm -hmm. uh, different option at stake, pros and cons of each option, and what you would do if you, if you were in my shoes. This is what I request to an external consultant. Yeah. A consultant that doesn't work like that, it's difficult that will continue to work with me. Um, that is very, so. very good advice. I teach writing to, in my fashion law department, and we spend a lot of time just focusing on communicating with business people. It's not like writing a brief for a litigation. It's about communicating an, a response that's definitive. No, yes, uh, actually, it happened several times to receive an email, uh, long 10,000 pages, so you can never print it because you consume all the paper in the office. And uh, in the end, you ask yourself, so what? <laughs> uh, so uh, this is uh, something that I always try to avoid. Thank you. Michael? Uh, my, uh, my ego and I aren't too big that we don't need um, help from outside counsel. Um, so I, I have to go out quite a lot because um, we have offices all around the world. Um, so I need to go and get the help from outside counsel, specifically uh, jurisdictional specific um, issues that we have. Um, we're quite a decentralized business. Uh, so our managing directors 
run their own offices um, and their own companies in Kenya and in, in Asia and Vietnam. So the, uh, very autonomous. Um, so they, and they've been doing it for years and years and years. So they have, you know, well, well before I came along. Um, and so they have their own local law firms who do their own local bits and pieces that they need doing. I tend to um, come along when there's big issues. That, and I don't necessarily use the law firm that, that, that they've already got a relationship with because sometimes they don't have the expertise which I need. Um, so I will use a different law firm in that jurisdiction, um, depending on, on what my requirements are. Um, sometimes I will use the law firm that, um, that, that they use. I've learned in this job um, that you know, I sort of went along with the idea that uh, everywhere that I go, I have to be using a big international law firm, no matter which country I'm in. Um, but in actual fact, I found out in, in certain jurisdictions, having a, a sort of a local law firm um, can actually be very, very good because they tend to know people. Um, sometimes, you know, it's a cousin who does this or that. Um, you know, uh, so you can get licenses a little bit quicker um, without paying bribes, um, just because it's the cousin. Um, so, you know, um, that, that, and that's quite important if, you know, when you're working in those jurisdictions. Um, talking about your other question, um, has anyone sort of gone, gone directly? Not really, uh, that's never happened. They've only been too delighted to dump everything on me as soon as I arrived. Um, so it was a case of my, you deal with the legal sort of side of things, and, and that's fine. And I've, I've retained, in the US, I've retained the counsel that we, we, uh, they, they already had. They've been absolutely excellent. They know the company inside and out. Um, they've been prepared to negotiate fees with me. Um, obviously, you bring, when you have, a, a, as a general counsel, when you arrive at the company, you bring something a little bit different to the outside uh, law firm because they know they can't really pull the wool over your eyes. Right. Um, as they might have been able to do to the business people who were instructing them previously. Right. So that's been, uh, um, th that's been very good. They've been very open to, uh, to discussions because I, I just don't believe in paying hourly rates. Yeah. I think every law firm uh, should uh, be, a, if, you know, if, if you're an expert in what you say you are and you're that good, you should know how much it's going to cost, all right? There may be a few little, you know, things which change things, but put that in the engagement letter. But I want fixed prices, um, and I want to know how long it's going to take. Um, and if you're as good as you say you are, you should be able to deliver that. Well, I think on that, our time is up. Um, thank you to this wonderful panel. Is there anything any of you thinks needs to be said before we close? I mean, we've got a very good day. We're talking about counterfeiting later, um, which, which is something would have been fun to talk about here, but hopefully you'll hear, hear our group. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.